I think in this section, <clears throat> I'll try to take up um, some of the paths suggested. The last to do with image and doctrine. <clears throat> will have, I think, ultimately irrelevance to the central question, but maybe not obviously in once. In the literature of the Hebrew scriptures, theophany plays an important, not to say central role. Another issue, by the way, an aspect that was neglected by all our good Germans. Um, I think because they're the children of Augustine, and anyone ever read here uh, St. Augustine's De Trinitate? None of the rest of you, eh? Only my patristics boy. Eh? Um, well, it's quite an eye-opener. If you want to know about a Western Christian Trinitarian thought, it is the Fons at Origo. And there's a lot of profundity to it. Gregory Palamas even lifts chunks of it. Uh, they don't, without attribution, um, in his uh, theological chapters. <coughs> so he liked bits of it. But the shocking part of it, at least I think it would be for most of us, it certainly was for me. It wasn't the bits about filioque, which, which is certainly there, but which he inherited, he didn't invent. Um, it was the opening chapters on the question of the theophanies of the Old Testament. Now, Augustine was faced, I guess we have to give a little bit of historical context, with a brand of um, anomian, <coughs> that is anti-Nicene, anti with an I, anti-Nicene uh, thought in the Christian West, which uh, said, which used the Theophanies to make an argument for the second person as less than God. Now, this is rooted in a commonality that is more or less ubiquitous throughout the anti, with an E, Nicene Fathers, that is, those writing before Nicaea. It is a universal feature of that earlier Christian literature to identify the one who appeared to Moses and Sinai and to Isaiah in the, temp uh, in the temple and to Ezekiel by the river Kebar and to Daniel in his dream as one like the Son of Man, as the second person of the Trinity. It is universal just as it is ubiquitous in our hymnography. Pick up any of the texts, or virtually any of the Christological, uh, the hymns for the Christological feasts, especially something like a Transfiguration but certainly there in the Nativity or Theophany. Um, in Holy Week, especially thick. He who sits upon the cherubim now rides upon the fall of an ass. All of that, all of those are implicit statements that he who appears in the scriptures of Israel is the second person, the Son. 
an illustration. In our uh, liturgical tradition, the wonderful pericope in Exodus 33-34, that's where Moses is on top of the mountain yet again. He's had to climb up again because Israel's done the bit with a golden calf and God is seriously ticked off. Yeah. <clears throat> and he has to persuade God, no, 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 you don't want to go away from you don't want to abandon him. No, 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 it looks bad. No, no, no. You have to you have to you have to stick with him. Um, and he persuades him. And then God says, okay, you're special to me. I speak to you as friend to friend, mouth to mouth. What would you have of me? And Moses says, show me your glory. Remember the passage? God says, I can't, you can't see my face because no one can see that and live. But I'll tell you what, there's this rock with a little hole in it. You go out there in the hole, and I'll pass by and put my hand over the rock so you won't see my face and die, but you'll see my back. And then afterwards, Moses comes down from the mountain with a shining face, yes, that scares all of Israel. He has to put a veil over it, but St. Paul uses this passage to very important effect in 2 Corinthians 3. That might I think which might come up a little bit later. Okay, that passage occurs in two places in the Orthodox theological year. It's assigned for the Old Testament readings in two places. One, naturally, the Transfiguration. Right? Top of a mountain, the Lord Jesus lights up. There's Moses and Elijah. Who also met God, Mount God, met God on the top of the holy mountain, and the disciples at their feet. And the lesson, certainly in the Synoptic Gospels, I think, it's very, very clear to me to mark. Um, I think this is, I think, to Archbishop Demetrius in his little book. Um, uh, what is it? Presence and um, power, authority and passion. Exousia Kapathos. Um, uh, Mark's kind of like a mountain. You go up, and the climactic point is that is the transfiguration story. Where is it where who Jesus is is revealed. Okay, so that's a natural place in our thinking, right? But the second place it occurs is the Vespers of the taking down to the cross in Good Friday. Now that's really deep, for want of a better word. Because that tells us, I think, that the Church wants us to understand that he who is revealed naked, beat, abandoned, mocked, spat upon on the cross is the very same glory who is revealed to Moses and to the disciples on the table. This too is the revelation of the glory of God. And with that word glory, we come to uh, the first and central, I guess, part of my discussion this afternoon. This is aware that all my graduate students and even uh, legions of unwilling undergraduates uh, were forced to learn. This is the Hebrew word kavod. The kavod Adonai, the glory of the Lord. Now, and Adonai, by the way, as you, as you probably are aware, is the, um, 
you know, the, uh, the, the expression you use, so you don't say that. You know, if you remember your English Bibles uh, that render the Old Testament, you will frequently see, you will frequently see LORD in all caps. Yes? Capital L, capital O, capital R. It's always rendering that. That's why. Um, this is the word of choice, kavod, in the, uh, in the Exodus story of uh, Sinai. Uh, it's very frequent in the Psalms. It shows up in Leviticus. It shows up in the consecration of the temple. In First uh, Kings eight, it is the term of choice in those texts and in that current, which scholars like to call, or used to like to call, P. Remember back to your Old Testament courses, the priestly source. Yes, it's P's favorite word. Yes, or his word of choice, or their word of choice. A school we're talking. About. For God visible. Now, parenthetically, but I think, again, somewhat to the point. The feast we celebrated yesterday was in a part the fruit of a centuries-long debate or clash to speak uh, Old Testamentally of the theologies uh, of D uh, of P and D. D stands for Deuteronomy. Because <coughs> if you look at the Exodus at the Exodus story of the appearance of God, you have God appearing. Yes, as a fiery, as the fire clothed in the the, the, the glory with the fire clothed in the cloud. The elders of Israel seeing God in Exodus 24 and eating and drinking. Moses entering the cloud of the uh, sheathing the divine glory at the end of 24 and staying there for 40 days and 40 nights. Parenthesis or footnote. Uh, in the ancient world, if the question arose, he was up there on top of that mountain all that over a month. What do you eat? What do you drink? Anyone ever been to Sinai? I've only seen pictures. Picture, well, what's there? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, rock. The monastery. Yeah, well, in the monastery, right. <laughs> but bushes are what? Pretty infrequent, yeah? But up on the top, there's nothing. Uh, nothing. Rock. There's a chapel. So, it's a rock. What do you eat and drink? You die. And from very early on, it seems, um, I think it's in Philo, like first century. He fed on divine light. And that turns up in the rabbis, he fed on the light of the she on the on the radiance of the Shekinah. And that turns up in Christian writers. Arguably it might be behind John 6. And the discussion of the man and the wilderness, because the well matter is the man is described as a bed of angels in Psalm, what is it, 70 something, 68. The bread of angels, so what's the bread of angels? The light of the presence. And then you find it in the, uh, in the, uh, in the Makarian homilist, in the early ascetical literature, and onward. And of course it's taken there and in the rabbis as an anticipation of the eschatological banquet. Okay, that's all... P. 
But then look at D. And you get something really, really different. Could you pick that up? D says in chapter 4, verse 12, Verses 11 and 12, you came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the midst of heaven with darkness, clouds and thick darkness, and the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the voice, <coughs> but saw no similitude. You saw no form. You only heard the voice. Whoa. So Deuteronomy has an anti, uh, you could say an anti-appearance or manifestation polemic, aimed at pity, I guess. Um, and you have this kind of tension in the old, in the, the scriptural sources themselves between God hidden and God appearing. You could say that plays out in the subsequent tradition in different ways, certainly in, the, in our tradition between the, you know, the apophatic and the cataphatic, and so on. But it plays out in a very specific way, I think, in the iconoclast debate, when St. John Damascene replies to the crit crit criticism of the images he quotes that very passage from Deuteronomy, which obviously they're quoting. You saw no form. And you might have heard, I mean, I've heard it several times, so you might have come across it too. The old, the old um, chestnut that, um, you know, the Hebrew literature, the scriptural literature, is all about hearing. And if you get into seeing, then it's all Greek stuff. It's all pagan uh, borrowing. That's very Protestant. They, they, like, they like to repeat that. You know, and it's true and it's false. It's true about Deuteronomy, dead on, and dead wrong about P, because the Hebrew literature, the Hebrew scriptures are full of mm -hmm. vision, and then there's a countervailing element. So we had it play out in the church in the eighth and early ninth centuries. in this very concrete way. Can you have an image in the church? <clears throat> so how does John counter that, St. John? Well, the version uh, that he's quoting in, um, uh, in defense of the sacred images, it's the word uh, form which appears very cool. Morphe. You saw no morphe. You saw no form in the fire. And he counters that a paragraph or two later with a reference to Philippians. Chapter 2. The famous hymn that St. Paul may have been quoting in support of humility. You know, he's, already, he's, he's talking to his Philippians and says, Stop quarreling with each other, be humble. And then he goes on to say, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus 
who being in the form of God, the Morphe Theu, and thought it not robbery to be equal to be God, to be equal to God. Emptied himself and took and was took upon him the form of a servant, Morfedul, and was made in the likeness of a man. And then he goes on to develop this case. But his his first statement being here that form is applied to the second person. form of God. Now, oh, back to Augustine, sorry. I didn't finish that part, did I? I started these things and didn't finish. Um, well, th that was the Homoian argument, that because it's the second person and because he appears, <coughs> therefore he's not God, because God is invisible. And by virtue of being visible, the Son is therefore not God but something lesser. So Augustine's answer is to say, the theophanies aren't about God. Any of the persons of the Trinity. They are created symbols. And serving the purpose of a particular pedagogic moment in the history of Israel, and then dispersing when their use was complete. It's the very position, as you will, that St. Gregory Palamas inveighs against in the opening of the Hagiridic tome. Um, about the light. Anyone who says this is a created thing that comes into being and then disappears, uh, that's a symbol, uh, is at odds with the fathers and the tradition. Okay, but it's particularly this notion of the Morphe that I'd like to look at a little bit more closely. And in line with something I said at the beginning of last hour, and this brings us into uh, questions of dogmatic theology. This word, uh, Morphe, interestingly, I'm going to go to Syriac. When that passage is rendered into Syriac, <coughs> it comes out as demut, likeness. This is the same word that appears in the second part of Genesis 126, in the image and likeness. In the Hebrew, Betzalem or Badmut, and in the Syriac, Demuta. And finally, we go to Ezekiel 126. The vision of the chariot, the, the, as it were, the lid of the ark, the kaparet. The cherubim throne come to life. Yes. Bigger than life. But he sees above the kebar. <coughs> and over their heads he sees, verse 26, above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. Not the color, blue. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of, as the appearance of a man upon it. And then down to 26, or 28. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. That was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Demut kevot Adonai. So we found this word demut, at least in the Syriac, rendering the morphe of Philippians 
the likeness which Ezekiel sees on the cherubim throne, which is at once in the, in the human form and the likeness of the glory. And Genesis 26, 126, in the image and likeness. Now, I would submit, and I'm following the line of some of the scholars I like, that there's a connection to be drawn there. That that hymn in Philippians is referring to this complex. The, 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 the kavod, the glory of God, in humaniform glory of God, um, and the and the tselem, the, the the image according to which we are made, the original for the human, right? See where I'm going? Right? Follow me. Hmm? No? Was there a no? You're always a trouble. You're always a pain. Down here. Um, <laughs> Um, okay. But Philippians 2 in the Morphe is, is an early Christological use that sees the second person, that sees Jesus of Nazareth as first the divine glory, the divine glory who appeared to Moses and the prophets. Now, that is arguably foundational for the whole anti-Nicene period and starting, up, I think, as early as the New Testament. But also linked to the image and likeness according to which humans are created, that he is as the divine morphe, as, the, as God manifest, the divine glory. He is the model according to which humanity is made. And that we find, in fact, virtually in so many words in the Epistle to the Colossians, where Christ is identified as the ikon. He is the ikon of the invisible God. And the same passage, by the way, in Philippians, or rather, yeah, Philippians. No, Colossians, sorry. The same passage in Colossians identifies him as the arche, the beginning. Which would lead us into another uh, related current of Second Temple speculation which put together the Bereshit of uh, the opening of Genesis, the in the beginning, where they, they, the same, as it were, ambiguity of the Hebrew B is, explo is exploited. So Reshit, beginning, is read as an actor in concert with what we read in regularly at Vespers, uh, Psalm 104, Behokma, in wisdom, with wisdom you have made all things. So the Rishit and the Hokma are identified. And it doesn't take a genius to see the impress of the wisdom tradition on the early Christological passages in the New Testament. Father, are you saying there that in the beginning, could almost be trans could almost be translated through the beginning, or or by means of, yeah. Okay, and the beginning, of course, being Christ. The, the beginning, yes, the, oh, wow. that would be the that's Christological. A major, that's, that's a major the, different. Uh, that would be the, Christ, the, the wow. Christological reading, but in line with a a, a tradition of hmm. Second Temple wow. speculation that is identifying the Rishit with the Hokma. That's it's majorly different than the conventional translation of the Of course. Wow. And the, the you know and the Christians come along when they when, wow. you know look, think back to the apostles wow. right and that first Christian generation 
okay, they're faced with something without a precedent. Yes? The rabbi they had loved and followed whom they believed was Messiah, but as we see in the Gospels, they didn't believe, they didn't understand. They, they never get it, right? They're always mucking it up. Yeah. And even an axe, you know, when after the... <coughs> after the resurrection. After the instruction. And they're sitting on the mountain, of all, Mount of Olives, when he's about to go back to heaven. Now are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> now are you going to do the Messiah thing? Yeah? Because that's what Messiah was. was. Read your uh, Isaiah 9. And he shall reign forever and ever. Right? Your handle, if you will. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's all trumpets. Right? No violins. That's why the, uh, the cross is such a shock. Why they're devastated, flattened. Why Peter takes him aside. You know the confession of Caesarea Philippi, the first little climactic point in Mark. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. And then he turns around and says, don't say that when, when the Lord begins to talk about the cross. Don't say that. Get behind me, Satan. Yeah. So you're not thinking like God, you're thinking like people. Well, that's how everybody thought. Messiah is going to save us from the Roman yoke. Messiah is going to set us up again over, set us up over the nation, other nations. Messiah is going to, you know, do all the stuff that it looks like Messiah is going to do in Isaiah. Isaiah 9. Be the perfect king. He doesn't match their expectations. But they are faced with the resurrection. There's no precedent for that. There are resuscitations, yes. You know, um, uh, the, the two uh, boys, uh, the widow's sons that Isaiah, that Elijah, Elijah and Elisha raised, uh, the dead man who's raised by Elisha's bones, contact with Elisha's bones, uh, the, the raising of Lazarus, the widow of Nain, the, the daughter of the head of the synagogue. But those are resuscitations. What is described in the resurrection accounts is not a res resuscitation. It's a change. Empty tomb, yeah, so there's, so there's continuity between the body of Jesus of Nazareth walking in Galilee and the body of the one who meets them, Irenaeus, or the Magdalene in the garden, or over the table in the upper room. But it's one that he has to initiate, a recognition he has to initiate, Irenaeus, in the breaking of the bread, with the Magdalene by calling her with her name, Mary, then she recognizes. In the upper room. It's a change. And this, this, is the, uh, this is the eschatological resurrection. The change, the transformed body. But that's as precisely eschatological and therefore of the world to come, but not everybody's participating in it. It's this singularity. And in light of that, how do you explain who he is? What he means? What are your tools? Your peasants from Galilee. Or maybe if you're like John seems to have been, you know, uh, an intimate of the high priest's family, well, you're, then you're illiterate, you're kind of upper class. But you're sure as heck not, uh, you know, running a philosophical school in Athens or Alexandria. And you don't have the, that panoply of Hellenistic abstractions uh, at your finger, like, you know, Musias and hypostases and all that. You don't have that. You have this. 
And what was going on around that? This, among other things. A name. The name. Like the high priestly prayer, where both of them appear. I have kept them in your name. And then I have given them the glory that you gave me before the beginning of the world. That's, by the way, deification of Allah. Or Paul. I mentioned 2 Corinthians 3. Makes important use of uh, Exodus 33, 34. Indeed, St. Paul makes that in order to conclude in 2 Corinthians 3 that what Moses had then, we have a greater now. Because his glory faded. But we, he says, are being transfigured, transformed, metamorphumatha. We are being transformed from glory to glory. And then down below, uh, six verses down in chapter 4, we have seen the light of God in the face of Christ within the heart. So on these foundations, they construct the foundations of the Christian faith. And all those elements in our dogmatic tradition, all of them, Christology, Triadology, they don't have the word Trinity yet. But there's the picture that you get in St. Peter. Uh, the speech in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. This Jesus whom you crucified, God has raised up, and he is enthroned at the right hand of the Father, and he has poured out this, meaning the Spirit, which you both see and hear. So there's your trinity in a picture, not in a word or in an abstraction, but in a picture, in terms of function and in terms that, was, that were comprehensible at the same time revolutionary. The revolution was in this. He is seated at the right hand of the power. Now in that rabbinic literature that I've enjoyed referring to the last, uh, these past two sessions, there's another passage which says, <clears throat> the angels have no joints, have no knees, because there is no sitting in heaven. <laughs> Only one sits. And we know who that is, right? Everybody else stands. <clears throat> I remember when I was a little boy, I was nine, <laughs> and we had our we had a wonderful iconographer come and do a gorgeous uh, communion of the apostles in, uh, in the apse of the church. Her name was Tamara Lizlova. Um, and she was wonderful. Just, just a, it was a spiritual experience to look at the face of that Christ. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, our bishop had it copied in the apse of his own chapel so that when our church burned, uh, it was preserved. But anyway, she was very devout. You know, she Tamara did. Alexandrovna. Huh? Tamara Alexandrovna. Yeah. She, did, she was a very devout woman. She did all the right things, you know, doing iconography. And I was in the back of the church with her one later. Gee, I, I was nine. I got tired. So I sat down. The next thing I know, there was this whack against my knee. Whack! And this Russian accent in my ear. Get up! Get up! Yeah. There is no sitting in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> So she was, she wouldn't have appreciated the comparison, of course, but she was echoing the rabbis. Right? <laughs> the angels stand, only one sits, but here is another who is seated. That's the revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Here is another who is seated. Where is this found? Acts chapter 2. And he is quoting. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand 
till I make your enemies your footstool. But Jesus, the Lord, and the Lord Jesus, of course, himself brings that, that psalm verse up in all three synoptics when he's giving his course of uh, uh, talks of the temple prior to his arrest. Remember that? He says, How does, who is Messiah? And they say, David's son. Oh yeah, how's he David's son? David calls him Lord. And that's the scandal. Two lords. Yes? Or as the rabbis put it, two powers in heaven, the heresy that they were fighting. Yes? Probably meant in part us. But maybe other Jews too. I don't know. Um, so those are the building blocks of our dogmatic uh, tradition, Christology and triadology and ecclesiology and anthropology. Ecclesiology because it is the body of this risen one glorified. That is the first, that is the beginning of the new creation into which we are incorporated. Yes? in baptism, which we put on. You know, the hymn that we sing uh, several times a year, as many as have been baptized into Christ, we say put on, and I guess the English, you know, is not immediately clear. The Greek certainly is. Who have been clothed with Christ. This is what it means. Like a set of clothes. Yes. Church Slavonic does Yes, the same yes, thing. yes, certainly, because the Slavonic will be usually a faithful rendering of the Greek. Um, but we have it more clearly. Uh, well, no, I have the same thing in the, the prayer of the Cherubicon, you know, uh, clothed with the grace of the priesthood. Yes? Well, that's an extra clothing. Say, but um, the clothing imagery again is something that they're building on. Saint Paul's building on with the past. You remember the story in Genesis three? You know, Adam and Eve having mucked up and failed to repent are given clothes of skin, coats of skin, and kicked out of the garden, right? Well, there seems to have been a, an exegetical development sometime before Christ, where they looked at the, the, the skin, coats of skin. And skin in Hebrew is ein resh, uh, and it's pointed with an O. So, or. But it happens that the word in Hebrew for light is also pronounced or, with an aleph, resh. And the tradition seems to have started as a result of that, you know, that pairing. That a, a picturing of the fall was a stripping Adam and Eve, finding themselves naked, they were stripped of the glory of God that had clothed them. And then given the new covering of skin. And we find that interpretation already in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Qumranites. They, they, they promised their devotees that they will recover through their discipline, kol kevod adam, all the glory of Adam the glory with which Adam was clothed, because Adam is the likeness of the kavod, yes? Kavod's the original. And in the rabbinic tradition, again, <laughs> these funny passages where, you know, the angels are confused. Which one are we supposed to bow down to? You know, they look alike. So God says, hmm. You get small. Oh, he's the one. He's the angry. You got onto you, right? 
He's the little one. But he didn't start out that way. Or he makes him fall asleep or something, or pushes him off the chariot. Right? Um, but he's like God, yes? But like the Kavod. And that, I think, is what St. Paul sees us as recovering in Christ. All the glory of that in being clothed with Christ. Restored to the original and better, in a way, than the original. Now, what's that have to do with the question that I started with this morning? Well, back to the priest standing before the altar, and before him, back to the high priest. How did the high priest function in the liturgy of Israel? as it were, iconographically. Well, we have a picture of it. Uh, the, the book of Jesus, son of Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus, which is um, written about 200 BC. It's not in the Hebrew Bible because they only have the Greek Translation made by Sirach's grandson. <laughs> There's a preface to the book which he, the grandson explains he's translating from the Hebrew. Um, but that Qumran, guess what? They discovered big chunks of Sirach in the, in the Hebrew. Well, it was written in Hebrew. Okay, sorry, that's a kind of aside. So in chapter 50 of Sirach, you have the description of a high priest on Yom Kippur. The priest Simon, the high priest son of Onias, who was honored when the people gathered round as he came out from behind the veil, like the morning star in the midst of the clouds, <coughs> like the moon when it is full, like the sun shining upon the temple of the Most High, like the rainbow shining in clouds of glory, like the bloom of the rose in the days of first fruits, like lilies by a spring of water, like a sprig of frankincense in the summer, like fire and incense in the censer, like a solid gold vessel decorated with every precious stone. When he took up a robe of honor and was clothed with the perfection of boasting in his ascent to the holy altar, he glorified the court of the sanctuary. Well, that was a very good article by uh, an acquaintance of mine, an Englishman, Christian Fletcher, Fletcher, Fletcher Woods. Like he's got a series of uh, lectures, actually, from Oxford on early Christology. And by the way, although he's a Protestant, he thinks we're right about everything. Um, <laughs> Where are these lectures available? Huh? Where are these lectures available? You can find them on the website uh, that my TA created for me and my graduate students. Um, it's called the Eastern, the Jewish Roots of Eastern Christian Mysticism. But you can look up it, look it up more easily if you if you type us in the search engine M A Q O M. Makom. It has tons and tons of articles, and Crispin's lectures are among them. Uh, and in this, he makes an argument I, which I think is quite impressive. Mm. I'm convinced, but of course I'm a soft target, as it were. Um, but he, that the high priest Simon here is portrayed as imaging the kavod, imaging the glory of God. He comes out and they fall down on their face before him. And then note the reference to the rainbow that I just read. The rainbow is associated with the manifestation of the glory in Ezekiel 1. And by the way, if you look at early 
uh, depictions of the Transfiguration, maybe even the present one, but the earliest one is uh, Sinai, St. Catherine's. Around the edge you'll see the rainbow. <coughs> Or monk cells. There's this wonderful um, uh, image from uh, the prayer niche. It seems of uh, of a Coptic monk from the seventh or eighth century uh, A.D. That was, uh, I think, it was uncovered by Antoine Guillemot. I'm not sure. There, you know, in the prayer niche, there's our Lord uh, on the chariot. You can see the little wheels uh, <coughs> with the eyes on the chariot throne in the rainbow. He's the one who appears in the, as the glory. And so the high priest here. And to go back, you know, the high, one, of the, one of the fundamental uh, uh, aspects of the high priest's uh, regalia is the blue of the, of the tunic. Why is the Mother of God in blue? Divinity. Heaven. Huh? Divinity. Heaven. What? Heaven. Divinity. Divinity. What? Heaven. Heaven. Well, okay. But you got two clues. You got Exodus. 24. When the elders see the God of Israel, they see beneath the God of Israel's feet a pavement, as it were, of sapphire stone. So there's blue in the Exodus Theophany. When Ezekiel sees the form on the, on the, on the, on the, on the chariot throne, the, chari the throne itself is, as it were, a sapphire stone. Blue. The blue is the color of the throne. So maybe your question from this morning had something to it, eh? It's the color of the throne on which the glory rests. The Vagrius Ponticus will take that up in the, uh, on the inner life in the passage I'll read tomorrow. Not today. <laughs> to save some thunder for her. Tomorrow. But the blue. So he is at the least the place of the divine glory. So I'll close with a story that I heard from an Estonian um, seminarian in the year I taught at St. Vladimir's Seminary 20 years ago. After Father John Meyendorf uh, died, um, they brought in uh, some of us ringers to, 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 to play, hold the place until they found a, a permanent permanent replacement. So I had it for a year. I quite enjoyed it. Didn't want to stay. <laughs> um, but it was great for you. And among my students, who were all very good, they were pretty good. Best was a Greek-American. John, what was it? Costas? Was John was really good. Cool, right. I had a bright Estonian, too. Sam Pusar. And Sam had not been born Orthodox and not been born Christian, actually. He had been born in an atheist household in uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet Estonia. And he'd grown up both atheist and hating Russians. Hating, hating. Um, nonetheless, he, said, he told me, I asked him once, how did you become a Christian? Well, he brought it up to me, in fact. I, I didn't have to ask because of the materials in the course. Kind of like to talk about, kind of like today. She said, you know, I became Orthodox and I'm a Christian. I said, no. He said, I was in Tallinn. Um, the Russian bishop was probably the then, you know, the one who became a patriarch, uh, Alexei, uh, was in a procession. And I heard this wonderful 
unearthly, beautiful singing. And I ran to, to in direction, and it was coming from this cloud of light around the bishop. This cloud of brilliance. And later I found out that the, you know, when I, after I'd become Orthodox and studied, I found out that what I, was he, what I had heard was the Easter canon, as it were, angelically delivered. Um, but he saw the glory of God, as he put it, clothing the bishop, whom he couldn't stand, personally. <laughs> whom he had no use for. But there was the glory of God around him. So he saw this, but this sort of experience, by the way, is reported in some of the Apothegmata, the, 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 deserts, the, the desert fathers. One of them, in fact, had a vision almost exactly on the same lines about a monk who's doubting the Eucharist. Or the worthiness of the priest who's celebrating the Eucharist, more accurately, I think. But he sees the, the light clothing in the priest and the voice that says, do you think I'd let one of my priests approach me without, as it were, protection. So that's what we are also when we stand before the altar. The image of the divine glory of Christ, who is the glory and the high priest. And with that note, I think I've run out my string. Yes, I have for today. Your money's work. <laughs>